Hello, this is Graham Newbig, and welcome back to CS11747, Neural Networks for NLP. This time I'll be talking about pre-trained word representations. So if we remember neural models, basically what they do is they take in uh, sentences and embed the sentences into a vector space, uh, which can then be used for word level uh, prediction or some variety of sentence level. Uh, prediction or sequence level. So then one question becomes how do we train embeddings? And we can do a number of things. One thing is initialize them randomly and train them jointly with the task we're interested in tackling. And this is mainly what we've discussed up to this point. Another thing that we can do is we can pre-train them on a, some sort of supervised task like part of speech tagging and test on another task like parsing. This is reasonable, but if they're both supervised tasks, then we might uh, lack data to uh, do this effectively for uh, the first task, and then uh, that results in uh, not as good accuracy when we apply them to the second task. Or more commonly, what we can do is we can pre-train on an unsupervised task, such as language modeling, that doesn't require any uh, annotations other than the text itself. And this is the kind of very popular paradigm nowadays that I'm going to be explaining over the next couple classes. So I'm going to be talking about word representations, and I'm noting non-contextualized word representations here. And uh, that'll be, what I mean by that will be a little bit clear in a moment. But before I talk about that, I'd like to talk about what do we want to know about words in the first place. So if we have words and we want to apply some sort of downstream model to them, some things that would be useful to know are, are they of the same part of speech? Do they have the same uh, conjugation or morphological features? Do the two words mean the same thing? Do they have some sort of semantic relation, like one word is an instance of another word, or one word is a part of another word, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And all of these are useful for different tasks. So, for example, part of speech uh, information might be useful for downstream syntactic tasks. Uh, words meaning the same thing could be useful for paraphrase identification, and semantic relations could be useful for question answering. And of course, you know, all types of information could be useful for any type of task. It's just a matter of degree. So there's um, two different varieties of word representations we can handle. One uh, variety is non-contextualized word representations. Another variety is contextualized word representations. And non-contextualized word representations, basically what they do is they take in a single word and calculate a vector for that single word. Take in another single word, calculate a vector for that single word, et cetera, et cetera. And contextualized representations, what they do is they take a whole sequence and they embed the uh, words in the sequence or tokens in the sequence into vectors based on the other context. In most modern applications, like BERT, we tend to use the latter, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the former because uh, it gives some good uh, background and also these are still used in uh, a variety of areas corresponding to, for example, knowledge extraction from, uh, from embedding spaces and other things like that. So contextualized representations we'll handle in the next uh, lecture. So I talked about the various types of information that would be useful to have about words. And before we did embedding-based methods, uh, one of the ways that we could get this information was by manually specifying it using human knowledge. So one example of something like this is WordNet. And WordNet is a large database of words, including parts of speech and semantic relations. So for example, we ha might have artifact at the top of this. Um, followed by motor vehicle, and then motor vehicle is followed by motor car, and motor car uh, has some other uh, examples such as hatchback, compact, uh, gas guzzler, etc., etc. And 
This is a very nice resource. Um, however, it was a major effort to develop, and uh, it was particularly an even greater effort to develop if you then wanted to expand it to different languages. So a natural question uh, that arises is, can we do something similar um, but more complete and without this uh, manual effort? So an answer to this uh, with a question mark, because it, it might not be a complete answer, is word embeddings. And word embeddings are continuous vector representations of words, and within the word embedding, the features of syntax and semantics may be included. So for example, uh, one of the first elements might be more positive for nouns, two might be positive for animate objects, three might have no uh, intuitive meaning whatsoever. So basically, um, we would like to get vectors where we essentially are able to encode much of the information that was included in WordNet and maybe even more. So word embeddings uh, are actually one of the major things that spurred so much interest in uh, kind of neural models or at least uh, neural networks applied to natural language processing. And the obligatory slide that I have to show with respect to this is uh, where we could take these embedding spaces and use the regularities to tell us something about words. So for example, if we take um, kings and we uh, subtract, if we take king and subtract uh, the word corresponding to man and add the word corresponding to uh, woman, um, we might get uh, something like queen being the nearest neighbor in the embedding space. Or if we take a king and kings um, and take the vector direction between them and apply the same vector to queen, uh, we might get uh, queens as the nearest neighbors. So these sorts of things can tell us things in semantic space, like the semantics of uh, gender of the word, or syntactic space, like the space of plural uh, of the word. And another famous example is where you essentially can um, take words, uh, countries, and correspond them with their capitals and uh, many, many other relations. And the reason why this is interesting is because, you know, WordNet specifies some of these relations, but definitely doesn't specify all of them. And so the embeddings give you an ability to capture all of this information, including in the handmade lexical resources and more. Um, so there's a, a fair amount of terminology uh, corresponding to these. Uh, so I think it's worth setting uh, this out, laying this out. So uh, we often hear about distributional and distributed representations. Basically, distributional representations are representations uh, that rely on the context that the word appears in to uh, learn them in some way. And this is uh, based on the distributional hypothesis in lexical semantics, which is that words are similar if they appear in similar contexts. In contrast, um, you could get non-distributional word representations. Uh, so in other words, not relying on uh, the distributional properties of words. And these could be created from lexical resources such as WordNet. But uh, the great majority of the time when we're talking about word representations, we're talking about distributional ones. Another different distinction is uh, the distinction of distributed versus local representations. And a distributed representation is basically something uh, where the representation is represented by a vector of values, each representing activations of some uh, variety, so like the ones I just talked about before. And in contrast, a local representation, uh, which is what we very frequently used before uh, much of NLP transition to neural networks, is where we represent each word or feature or whatever by a single discrete sy symbol or a one-hot vector. So uh, distributed and distributional mean totally different things, but they're similar. So they're, uh, you know, similar words, so they may be easy to uh, confuse. So to give an example of distributional representations, what I'm showing here is something that we call keyword in context. So the red bar 
is above uh, the keywords Pittsburgh and Cleveland, and the blue bar is above the surrounding context. And this is actually a tool used by linguists also to examine how words are used in a particular corpus. Uh, so this sort of context can be useful for understanding words, not only for uh, machines, but also for humans. And so basically the way a distributional representation would work is we take the words, we take all of their contexts, and then we essentially do some sort of operation to match uh, words that appear in similar contexts. And as an example of this, there are count-based methods uh, that create basically a word context count matrix. So count the number of co-occurrences of word uh, in context with rows as words and columns as context. Um, there are other things that we can do, like weighting uh, these counts with pointwise mutual information between the two uh, words. And uh, once we have this large matrix, we can reduce the dimensions uh, using singular value de decomposition to kind of smooth over uh, things and make the uh, distributions rep uh, generalize better between words. And then we can do, uh, like measure the similarity between words by measuring the closeness of the resulting vectors using cosine similarity, generalized Jacquard similarity, et cetera, et cetera. So these methods have actually been around for quite a long time, well before, you know, starting uh, neural network methods uh, in NLP. But uh, recently, the more common way of doing these for various reasons is uh, prediction-based methods, where we instead try to predict uh, the words within a neural network. And so we either feed in the context and try to predict the words themselves, or we feed in the words and try to predict the context. Uh, but either way, this is kind of like a language model, it, but it's a language model designed in a way so that we get good word embeddings as a byproduct. So just to give one example of how we could do this, uh, we've talked about feed-forward language models before, uh, where we essentially feed in the previous two words and try to predict the next word. So we could essentially use uh, the word embeddings from the lookup uh, table here, or the word embeddings from the softmax matrix here as examples of uh, word embeddings or like to train word embeddings in our uh, regular language model. However, uh, words are not just dependent on the previous context. So in doing embedding learning, it's very common to uh, use methods that look at context windows on both sides of the word itself. So if we don't need to calculate the probability of the sentence, uh, these methods become uh, possible. And uh, this also moves us closer to the context used in count-based methods, or even the keyword in context that I showed you before. And these methods drive uh, word to vec fast text, other uh, related toolkits. So just to give a few examples of them, um, we have the SIBO method which predicts a word based on the sum of the surrounding embeddings. So we basically mask out uh, the word here, in the middle here, and we take all of the surrounding embeddings, we sum them up, get it, uh, an embedding, and we multiply this by a uh, weight matrix for a softmax and get scores and get probabilities. So this is the, the general model uh, that word to vec uses. So it looks a lot like a language model, but we have the context on both sides. And also notably, this is not a neural uh, network model with a hidden layer. It's just a single addition of the um, surrounding embeddings. And because of this, this is very fast. It allows you to learn very quickly. Oh yes, and we calculate the loss with respect to the probabilities. So we have a code example of this, if you'd like to take a look at it. So another uh, thing is a skipped gram model. And in a skipped gram model, essentially what we try to do is we try to predict each word in the context given the word. So we take the word and uh, we get uh, probabilities or scores from this. And then we calculate the loss with respect to all of the surrounding words.
Um, this is a little bit less intuitive. It's essentially a um, not language model predicting a single word, but you're predicting all of the surrounding context. But uh, essentially, one of the good things about this model is it gives you more uh, feedback signal. It gives you a signal from four words instead of uh, only a single word. And uh, that kind of makes it more um, uh, learn faster in some cases. Uh, and uh, it tends to be as good or better, but maybe learn a little bit more rapidly. So we have an example of this too. So if we compare account-based and prediction-based methods, there's actually very interesting theoretical analysis that demonstrates that there's a strong connection between count-based methods and prediction-based methods. And specifically, uh, the skipgram objective is equivalent to matrix factorization with pointwise mutual information weighting and a discount for uh, the number of samples k. Um, where we're going to be talking about this uh, negative sampling-based approach. Um, or, uh, sorry, we, we talked about this negative sampling-based approach um, in the efficiency class. Uh, so um, in reality, uh, WordDevec for efficiency purposes is uh, trained using negative sampling where we don't expand the whole softmax uh, matrix here, um, but rather do some negative samples and, and uh, calculate the scores there. And because of that, um, essentially, we have this, this discount term over here. So uh, long story short, WordDevec is, uh, is very similar to these matrix factorization approaches. However, um, if we have a very large vocabulary, uh, factorizing a matrix can actually become very cumbersome. And because of this, WordDevec's kind of method of predicting over individual examples can actually be quite a bit more efficient than what you would get out of the um, matrix factorization. So another widely used method is called GLOVE. And GLOVE is essentially a matrix uh, factorization approach. And it's motivated by ratios of uh, probability of word given context probabilities. So what do I mean by this? Um, an illustrative example that's in the paper and is uh, kind of a good way of uh, illustrating this fact is if we look at the words ice and steam uh, and we think about the characteristic difference between these two, um, the characteristic difference between them is that ice is essentially a solid and uh, steam is a gas. So both of them are related to water and uh, the kind of probability of seeing water next to ice and steam is high. But if we just look at the probability of water, um, essentially we might ignore some of the other important information contrasting these two words, um, namely solid and gas. And so the idea is essentially that GLOVE relies on the ratio of uh, probabilities between words. And if we look at the ratio of the probability of solid uh, with respect to ice and uh, steam, we see that it's large for, um, uh, for ice and gas, uh, the ratio with respect to gas is uh, large for steam, essentially. So, there's a nice derivation in the paper from uh, the start to the final loss function that satisfies a number of desiderata. So for example, uh, that it's meaningful in linear space with respect to differences in dot products. Uh, there's word and context invariance, and it's robust to low frequency count, uh, contexts. And uh, based on this, they arrive at this, um, this formula here, which you can then optimize using a uh, incremental matrix factorization alg algorithm. So basically, um, uh, GLOVE has also been uh, pretty widely used in NLP. It's a quite different approach uh, compared with a prediction-based approach uh, such as WordDevec, but I think it's worth knowing anyway. So next question is, if we're relying on context for uh, learning these embeddings, what context should we be using? And actually, context has a very large effect. It's 
uh, perhaps even larger effect than you know, what specific learning algorithm you use. And for example, if you use a smaller context window, this can give you more syntax-based embeddings. And a larger context window, you get more semantics-based or topical embeddings. And if you think about this, this becomes uh, you know, fairly um, intuitive, I guess. So basically, if you look at the immediate surrounding words for any particular noun, um, the word on the left might be the, the word on the right might be something like um, did or you know, another verb or something like this. So if you look at the immediately surrounding verbs, these might be kind of generic verb, uh, immediately surrounding words, these might be generic words that kind of just point to the fact that this is a noun. But if you look more widely, like for example, throughout the entire document, the words are going to be become uh, like more topical, like more uh, with respect to what topic the whole uh, document is talking about. So uh, that's something important. There's also other methods where you can take like uh, contextually surrounding context, like do dependency parsing or some sort of syntactic analysis of the sentence. And if you do something like this, you might get more functional um, uh, embeddings that have things with words with the same inflection group together, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really important. And this will also be important in the following lecture when I talk about uh, contextualized embeddings. And basically, which prediction task uh, do you use, which features do you feed into the model will have a large effect on essentially you know, what things you can learn. So next I'd like to talk about evaluating embeddings. And I think this is uh, of interest uh, as well because you know, let's say we've trained embeddings in an unsupervised fashion. How do we even know they're useful at all? So there's a number of types of evaluation. Um, there's intrinsic evaluation and extrinsic evaluation. So intrinsic evaluation is how good is um, a particular thing based on its features. Another thing is how useful is it uh, downstream. So intrinsic evaluation is, um, and sorry, yeah, actually I'll, I'll talk about some examples of this in the following slide. Another thing is uh, qualitative versus quantitative evaluation. And qualitative evaluation examines the characteristics of examples. So you look at individual examples. And quantitative evaluation uh, calculates statistics of some sort. So uh, these types of evaluation, uh, of course, you know, apply to all different varieties of tasks. But um, they're particularly important, I guess, uh, when you're thinking about unsupervised tasks that don't have clear evaluation objectives in the first place. So um, one qualitative analysis method that you can use is visualization of embeddings. And these reduce high dimensional embeddings into 2D or 3D space. And this is one example of doing so with a linear model called PCA. And uh, we can see that, you know, as I mentioned before, we can map between countries and the capitals of the countries. Um, so it gives you an idea of the structure of the space. You can also use uh, nonlinear projections and nonlinear projections essentially group things that are close in high dimensional space. Um, so they try to capture the structure of the neighborhood of the embeddings as opposed to um, you know, just the geometry of the space as a whole. And um, TSNE uh, is a, um, uh, a thing that uh, basically tries to group things together that give each other a high probability according to a Gaussian distribution. And this is a very simple example of using TSNE or TSNE over um, images of digits. And if you do a dimension reduction with respect to um, PCA, a linear dimension reduction method, you get um, kind of a random, uh, like blurred together uh, graph here uh, that doesn't have clear boundaries between the different characters. Um, but if you do this with uh, TSNE, 
you can see that you basically get a, um, a thing with good separation between the different digits. So this kind of demonstrates that it's able to capture the underlying structure of the, of the task. Um, and we have code example for this if you'd like to test it out. However, uh, one issue with nonlinear models is uh, like neural networks are less interpretable than feature-based linear models. Um, the visualization itself can be uh, misleading. So there's a nice uh, kind of online demonstration of this that uh, you can see in the references. But basically, um, if we have the original uh, data here, we can do a dimension reduction of this uh, with uh, Tisney, and depending on the settings, we get something that's all over the place, something that does actually look like two groups, or even something that's spread all over. And another thing is uh, linear correlations um, cannot necessarily be interpreted. So these two things are obviously lines uh, between each other, but if we do the nonlinearity, it can uh, split up these lines into different pieces. So uh, just something to be aware of that it's quite sensitive to the parameters of the, the visualization software. So. Okay, um, so talking about intrinsic evaluation of embeddings, I have a categorization um, from uh, Schnabel et al. in the references. And basically there's um, a relatedness and relatedness is the correlation between um, embedding cosine similarity and human evaluation of similarity. And so we ask humans, like which example do you think is more similar uh, versus less similar? Uh, there's also analogy tasks. So um, we have A is to B is X is to Y, uh, like the uh, king, queen, uh, man, woman example, like I showed before. And we can also um, do categorization where we create clusters based on the embeddings and measure the purity of the clusters um, using uh, something called distractor tests, where we essentially test whether humans are able to efficiently uh, distinguish the one odd thing that doesn't belong to the cluster uh, versus the things that actually are in the cluster. And another uh, thing that's included in the categorization, but it's maybe a little bit less common, is um, selectional preference-based evaluation, where essentially we determine whether a noun is a typical argument of a verb using just the embeddings. So extrinsic evaluation um, can be done through using word embeddings in, in systems, and this is very common now um, for contextualized embeddings, which we'll talk about next class. And basically, we mostly just evaluate the embeddings based on how they improve downstream performance. Um, and there's a number of ways we can do this. We can take a neural model and we can initialize its embedding matrix with the embeddings. Um, or we can take pre-trained embeddings and concatenate them with learned embeddings uh, together. Um, the latter is more expressive, but it leads to an increase in the model parameters because now we need to use the um, frozen embeddings, uh, initial embeddings, and the learned embeddings. And also, um, if we... Uh, one other issue um, with initializing with the embeddings and then kind of fine-tuning over them is that as the model learns, it might kind of forget its nicely formed embedding space that you learned through pre-training and fail to generalize well to other, um, to other words that were included in the original embedding training data but not included in the downstream task uh, data. So another question uh, that you might ask is, well, if there's lots of embedding methods out there, how do I choose which one I should use? And there's really no one-size-fits-all embedding. So this is an example where they tested lots of different types of embeddings. And on some tasks, some were better than others. Uh, some were very good on relatedness tasks, um, uh, but less good on kind of the selectional preference-based task, whereas others were uh, particularly good on uh, chunking, uh, which is a type of syntactic analysis. Um, 
so basically, there, there's no clear answer here. And another question uh, may be, well, downloading and using pre-trained embeddings, embeddings is a bit of a pain. When should I be using them? And the answer is um, basically when the training data uh, for your downstream task is insufficient. So this is very useful when you're doing most tasks that require some sort of human annotation of the output labels, like tagging or parsing or text classification. It's less useful for tasks like machine translation that might have very, very large um, training data sets compared to other supervised tasks. And embeddings essentially will probably not be useful if you're doing something like language modeling, where the training data for the embeddings themselves would be the same as the data that you would have for the language modeling, or at least could be obtained just as easily. So I've talked about a bunch of features of embeddings, and I'd also like to talk a little bit about how we can improve embeddings and make them more effective. So there's a number of limitations that we'd like to address. Um, so one is uh, that they're sensitive to superficial differences, like dog versus dogs, um, which only vary in a single uh, character. Uh, another one is they're not necessarily coordinated with knowledge or across languages. Uh, so we'd like to fix this issue as well. So um, we might want to learn languages, um, embeddings that work well across a number of languages or uh, are coordinated with a knowledge base like WordNet. Um, they also are sometimes not interpretable and they can also encode biases like stereotypical gender roles or racial biases, which might be carried to downstream systems that use the embeddings. So one way to improve over uh, the issue with respect to superficial differences between the uh, words is to uh, capture subword regularities. And there's a number of ways to do this. Like um, there are methods that essentially uh, do morphological analysis, um, analyzing the internal structure of the words. Um, there's also ones that use character-based uh, like RNNs or, or CNNs or things like this. Uh, but one that I recommend and is uh, used particularly widely is a method based on bag of character engrams. And so basically what this does is this um, breaks up the word into a bunch of n-grams over the characters. So like um, b word beginning, wh, w-h-e, h-e-r, etc., etc. And um, you can use n-grams from three to six plus embeddings for the word itself if it's a highly frequent word. And um, I, I found this to be very useful um, in my own work and it's also used in the fast text toolkit, which I'll be talking about in a bit. So another issue that we talked about is lack of coordination of embedding spaces. So um, we can have word embeddings in two languages that we trained independently, and we might want them to match across the languages. So this is a very widely researched topic from 2013 or 2014. Um, and there's basically um, a, a many, many different ways that you can do this coordination, both with supervised data and unsupervised data. Um, this paper that I'm citing here is kind of a, a supervised approach where you prepare a small dictionary uh, between the two languages and you try to make uh, do a transform over the space using matrix multiplications or something like that to make sure the dictionary words match together. And you hope that essentially if you make the dictionary words match together, other words that are not included in the dictionary will also do so due to the regularity of the embedding space. So um, here are some examples of this where um, in the original embedding space, um, some words that were you know, more semantically similar were split apart. And after you did this, uh, you got words that uh, were semantically similar grouped together. So not only does this coordinate across the space, but it also improves the underlying space as well. 
So as I mentioned, you can use supervised methods or unsupervised methods, and we can do it with no dictionary at all. Um, so there's a number of ways to do this, like using uh, identical words, only uh, digits, for example. Um, another thing that we can do is match distributions. So we take advantage of the fact that, for example, um, words like uh, cat may be more frequent uh, than words like horse. So uh, Mao means cat in Chinese and Ma means uh, horse. And so by taking advantage of the fact that the underlying word embedding spaces are isometric in some way. So in other words, if we do a transformation of them uh, between each other, um, we should be able to kind of recover similar um, uh, words in a similar space. And also taking advantage of frequency information, we can actually do quite well is under some you know, mild assumptions. Like for example, that the underlying content of the uh, text in the two languages is similar. Another thing we can do is retrofit embeddings to existing lexicons. So if we have an existing lexicon like WordNet and we'd like our vectors to match, we can um, essentially train embeddings so that words that were listed as synonyms in the original lexicon are given similar vectors in the word embedding space. So I also talked about how word embeddings might not be interpretable. And uh, one way that people have uh, dealt with this is by dealing by doing sparse embeddings. So um, each dimension of uh, a word embedding is not necessarily interpretable, as I mentioned before. And part of the reason why is because, um, you know, if we have a limited number of embeddings and they need to um, encode many uh, different uh, pieces of information, uh, one particular embedding might encode, you know, this is animate and blue and, um, and a noun or something like this. And if you have animate, blue, and noun all in a single embedding, it's really hard to interpret what's going on there. Um, so essentially uh, what some work does is it adds a sparsity constraint um, to essentially ensure that most of the embeddings are not, um, not active at any time, but we have a very large number of embeddings and all of the embeddings need to be positive. And if we do that, uh, this essentially can greatly increase the interpretability of embeddings. So for example, um, uh, one uh, dimension of this would get something like inhibitor, inhibitors, antagonists, receptors, inhibition is its top values. Um, another one might be like cities in Britain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we, um, uh, this is one method you can use to make uh, embeddings more interpretable. So another issue is that um, embeddings uh, can reflect the bias in the statistics of the underlying data that we um, got them from. And uh, for example, one famous example of this is uh, gender bias. And uh, if we look at the professions that are most similar to, for example, he or she, uh, we get things like homemaker, nurse, receptionist, librarian, socialite. Um, for he, we get maestro, skipper, protege, philosopher, captain. Uh, and of course, there is nothing saying that a man cannot be a homemaker or she cannot be a maestro. Um, or uh, a man can not be a nurse, uh, for example. Um, but either traditionally or currently, uh, there is a um, statistical bias towards uh, particular you know, professions corresponding to genders. And you can think of any other uh, bias. And in fact, uh, there's a very nice paper uh, by uh, Dan Jarevsky's group uh, that demonstrates that over time, uh, the words associated with uh, particular uh, racial groups, for example, um, are associated with very, you know, horrible biases uh, historically. And this could have real downstream consequences. Like, for example, 
um, if we use these embeddings in a system that was supposed to recommend professions for people or do matching between uh, job ads and uh, people, if uh, there was you know, a match of either these explicit gendered pronouns or you know, even implicitly to your name or something like this, then it, this might result in you not being recommended for a job that you're perfectly qualified for based on your gender. And you know, there's any other uh, amount of examples that could, uh, where this could occur. So um, there are a, a number of methods that have looked into this. And for example, um, there's gender uh, appropriate she, he, what, like one method to do this is if you look at gender appropriate she, he analogies, uh, like queen and king, sister and brother, uh, mother and father, where the underlying word itself is kind of uh, gender, gendered, um, then what, this, what uh, this method that I'm citing here does is it essentially um, tries to neutralize the gender stereotype analogies uh, so that they do not vary along the he-she dimension while maintaining the gender-appropriate she-he analogies. And um, this can reduce, mitigate the effect of bias to some extent. And there's a lot of follow-up work on this if you're uh, interested. So finally, I'd like to go into a quick case study of the Fast Text Toolkit. So it's a widely used toolkit for estimating word embeddings. And um, it's fast, but effective. And with respect to the methodology that goes into it, it uses a skipgram objective with uh, character-based ngram encoding, character ngram-based encoding, uh, which allows you to capture subword structure. Um, it includes parallelized training in C++ to make it fast. And it uses uh, negative sampling for fast estimation, which we covered in the, uh, in the efficiency class. And there are pre-trained embeddings for Wikipedia on many languages that you can feel free uh, to use in your work if you're uh, so interested. So that is all for this time. Uh, thank you very much. And basically for the discussion question, I would like you to think about some issues uh, that I talked about in the end of the class, um, whether you think these issues could be mostly solved by the methodology that I introduced in the paper. So you can go in and take a look at uh, one of the papers. And then uh, which issues may not be solved by the methodology that was included there. So uh, thank you very much. That is all I have for today and I will see you uh, next time.